Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Sandra Spencer, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. And as you see on the screen, uh, our co-presenter today was going to be Linda Gargan, who is the Director of the Parent Support Provider National Certification Initiative here at the Federation. But Linda was traveling in, and her plane was uh, delayed, and so she has not gotten here yet. So uh, we're going to go ahead with me today, and I'm going to be presenting the webinar. Uh, I also have, uh, along with me, Joy Spencer, who is going to be watching our chat box uh, for any questions or comments that you all may have. So uh, I ask that you make this very interactive by you using the chat box if you have questions or comments. Uh, that you like to make to the group. Uh, Joy is going to watch that chat box and she's going to be reading some of those questions or comments to us so that we can all share information. So we're going to get started and I look forward to um, interacting with you all throughout this one hour presentation in the chat box. So we're talking today about training, supervision, and certification for parent peer support. Um, I'm going to just start by giving you uh, the definition that the National Federation of Family uses for a parent support provider. We say that a parent support providers are primary caregivers who have the lived experience of being actively involved in raising a child who has experienced emotional, developmental, behavioral, substance use, or mental health challenges. Parent support providers have experienced navigating systems, child serving systems, to address and to support families. Parent support providers have received specialized training to assist and empower other families who are raising children with similar experiences. So this is kind of what we use as our definition of a parent support provider. And just a little bit of a history. In 2007, uh, the National Federation of Families did a, a collection of analysis of job descriptions, uh, and terminologies for the parent peer support role. Uh, and we figured out that there was a lot of names and job descriptions to fit this role. So in 2010, we narrowed it down uh, and came up with the title parent support provider. And then we established uh, a bunch of competencies that we thought would be valid for the role of a parent support provider. And then we went through a process of getting consensus around these competencies. And then later on in 2010, we did a job task analysis. Uh, we formed a, a panel of uh, subject matter experts. And then we launched our first uh, pilot of an exam. So up to date right now, we have close to 170 or more certified parent support partners across the country in 35 states. So we're really excited. So one of our main eligibility criteria is that Parents have to have the lived experience of raising a child. And so uh, that's the basis for this program. So let's get started and let's talk a little bit about training. So one of the things that uh, you have to keep in mind when you're really going to talk about training parent peer support providers is what uh, identify your external requirements. So what is needed in your state? What, what is needed in order for you to do uh, training that may meet the Medicaid requirements or may meet your state requirements or may meet your accreditation requirements. So you need to make sure what's uh, out there in your state and what's your requirements, especially if you're going to want this service to be a Medicaid billable service. Identify what your organizational requirements are. We know that not all peer support uh, parents are hired through family organizations, so sometimes they're hired through different agencies, and those agencies may have their own requirements to hire in parent support providers. Make sure you're having conversations with key stakeholders, people who will be your customers, people who will be your clients. Make sure you build a good consensus around what these core competencies are, what they should be to meet their need. And then review training curriculum. We really stress to people to not try to recreate the wheel. There is a lot of training out there. There's a lot of curriculum that's already been developed through different organizations, through family run organizations. So spend some time shopping around and looking to see what already exists in the field of training before you try to set out and develop your own. The National Federation 
uh, in our national certification, we have 11 domains of competency. So uh, we have uh, really set these competencies up, and they include ethics, confidentiality, effecting change, behavioral health, education, communication, parenting, advocacy, empowerment, wellness, and natural support. And so we have decided that these would be the core competencies for national certification. So a lot of times when people are looking for training, they try to really match the training that they're looking for to fit whatever competencies that they're expecting their families to have. So the first point is training should reflect the role of the parent support provider. So you really need to be really clear about what role you want those people to play so that the training can meet those needs. Training should be reflective of your organization's culture and the mission of the organization. So if you're hiring through an agency like Child Welfare Services, or a family-run organization, you really want to make sure that the job that this peer support person is doing is going to match with the culture of your organization. Training should be routinely evaluated and changes made, so it's not a one and done thing. We don't train one time and then think that people can go out and do the job for the next 10 years. So you should always reevaluate the training that you give, make sure that it can happen on a continuous basis. Training should be well-rounded. And this should include information about the individual level, which is the child and family team level, helping that individual family. But your training should also cover issues on a systems level. How do you train uh, your parent peer support providers to understand different agencies and different systems and how they operate? And training should not be intimidating. We want to make sure that the training can be something that's comfortable, that's comprehensible, and that people can really um, grasp a full knowledge of what it means to be a parent support provider. Uh, the national certification requires eight contact uh, hours of training for each of our domains. So like I said, we have 11 domains, and so we require 88 hours of training to meet uh, our criteria. So here is a quick training tip. Training should not be just enough to make you dangerous. And we know that sometimes to get a little bit of information and then to send people out into the field to do a particular job, they sometimes know just enough to not really be helpful. And sometimes they can know just enough to cause harm, to not have enough information to families. But training should be enough to make you highly effective. So that's the goal. We want really highly effective parent support uh, providers out in the field. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about supervision. We get an awful lot of questions here in the national office about supervision uh, and how supervision should look. So we're going to start and have a conversation about that. First of all, supervision must have and be based upon a good job description. So we need to make sure we know what that supervisor's job is, what, what it looks like, and make sure that we communicate that clearly. The supervisor's job must answer the question, how can I better support you? Supervision for a parent support provider, because they are operating off of their lived experience, has to be the role of supporting them in that job. Supervision should include both, include both a clinical and non-clinical elements. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And uh, supervision can occur in different and a variety of modalities. There's one-on-one -on -one supervision, there's group supervision, peer supervision, and team supervision. We're going to discuss each one of these in depth in a few minutes uh, throughout the webinar. So what is the content of your supervision? And we know that supervision uh, comes in many different areas. So there's administrative and practice supervision. As I mentioned earlier, there's clinical and non-clinical supervision. There's theoretical and there's that practice piece or that lived experience part of peer support provider supervision. And then there's the individual and the advocacy portion of what we do. So let's get started talking about the administrative role. 
So the administrative role usually comes from the agency that hires you, whether it's a, a, a formal child serving agency or family or youth run organization. And this kind of supervision usually handles your personnel issues. It, it handles your evaluation process, your vacation, your leave. Uh, it, you, that's usually who you turn in your timesheets to, that kind of stuff. So this is the personnel issue. The other part of administrative supervision is documentation, making sure that you have everything you need and it's recorded so that you can do the proper billing, making sure you are doing the right kind of filing and file management. So these kind of tasks are usually uh, administrative tasks, and sometimes they're one and the same uh, supervisor, but sometimes it's just done exactly uh, directly through the agency that hires you. So let's move on and talk about practice supervision. So uh, practice supervision is uh, things like reviewing uh, case reviews, talking about the status of that family, where they are, where they're headed, what they need. Uh, it also helps uh, the parent support provider review their techniques for sharing their lived experience. So it's very important that we review that, uh, that parent support providers know how much of their lived experience to share, when to share it. And so that comes a lot, uh, a part of that practice supervision. And that's a real important part because one of the things we want to make sure in our supervision that parent support providers are listening to and really trying to meet the needs of the family and just not in it to really share their lived experience, but know exactly when to share it when it's helpful. And then this, this kind of supervision reviews caseload to make sure that uh, families don't have too many uh, families on their caseload and then to really monitor the intensity. So we talk about something called the 2080 rule when sometimes uh, 20% of your families on your caseload can take up 80% of your time. So you want to make sure that there's a balance there. It would really not work if 80% of your families were taking up 80% of your time. So you're going to have to make sure that some families are kind of low need families on a caseload, along with families who may have a very high intense need. And then that changes. Um, depending on how much support the family gets and when they really feel like they can do some things without as much uh, support from the parent support provider. And then sometimes practice supervision includes role play. It's really important to kind of discuss what's going on with the family, how you would handle difficult situations or more challenging situations. So a role play can be a very helpful part of practice supervision. And then practice supervision really helps the supervisor identify the skills and the skill sets that may need to be enhanced to identify where there is more need for training in a particular area and to give really good feedback to the parent support provider. So let's move on and talk about this issue of clinical and non-clinical supervision uh, because we know for a fact that in order for uh, parent support providers or any kind of peer support providers to uh, be Medicaid billable, you will have to have some type of clinical supervision. So on the clinical supervision side, uh, it really will help you understand uh, the diagnostic challenges. Clinical supervision can help us understand medication, diagnoses, and some of those things that we may not understand just from our limited lived experience. They can also help us review the status of um, the family's history, their medical history, their clinical history, and help us see if there are some other clinical needs within the family. We know that it's very uh, stressful um, on caregivers raising children with mental health issues. And sometimes uh, as a parent support provider, we need to really uh, be able to know and realize when the parent may be having some issues and they may also need some clinical help. They help us develop techniques and questions for upcoming appointments. We know that a part of our job is helping families know what to ask clinicians when they're visiting their uh, psychologist or their therapist or their, even their pediatrician to really help families know what questions to ask so that they can get the best help and support. And then it also uh, helps us understand clinical uh, lexicon. We, what I mean by that is helping us understand the very clinical terminology that very clinical vocabulary that we can hear sometimes 
when we accompany uh, families to some of their meetings. So that clinical piece of supervision is very, very, very important. And so we need to make sure that uh, we have that. And then there's that non-clinical piece. That's where uh, families can uh, be supervised by another family member uh, who also have the lived experience. And we can review with that family member what kind of supports that they have, uh, what kind of supports they can offer to the family. Uh, Non-clinical supervision can talk about naturally or caring supports that are in the community. Uh, help a family realize what supports they already have within their family, within their network of friends, within their faith community that they can use for support. Uh, we can also do non-clinical supervision around the advocacy work, the work that we need to do in helping the family know how much to advocate for themselves, how to be assertive, uh, and get what they need from their uh, service team. And then we can also practice reviewing coaching techniques because we know that the end result from the role of a parent support provider is really helping and coaching a family so that they can walk through and navigate systems on their, on their own so that they can get the best outcome. So again, there's uh, two types of supervision that we think is needed for parent peer support. So the other topic that I talked about is there's a theoretical or there's practice uh, supervision, very practical. So the theoretical is the model in which we use to treat children, youth, and families. So this can be wraparound. I know that a lot of you on this call are uh, with currently funded system of care communities, and one of the uh, techniques you all use is the wraparound process. So we want to make sure that supervision can cover the wraparound process and a family's role in that. There are some other uh, practices that we always teach the family support provider, and that's the notion of family-driven care. And we know that family-driven care is very important in the work that we do so that we can make sure that families have a voice in the care of their uh, children's treatment, as well as have a voice in how um, they are seen as a part of the team that they're primary decision making. Uh, and then you've got it. We you know we talk a lot about making sure that young people and youth have a say so in their own treatment. And we want to make sure that we help empower them to do that. So all of these uh, theoretical uh, supervision models are important. And then we notice that as a nation, we're moving more to person-centered care. And we really know that person-centered care is all about making sure that services fit the need of the person, but that that person can decide also who else is a part of their inner circle. So that it's also including the families and whoever that person considers to be family. And so you move from kind of the theory over to the practical. And we talked a little bit about this a few minutes ago. That practical piece is sharing your story so that the person you are working with can be more comfortable sharing their story. And then some of the other practical steps is really learning how to respect the uniqueness of each family. And in this respect, we're talking about understanding the cultural uh, context of that family, uh, what those families' traditions are, what their cultural values are, and respecting that and really going forth when you're working with that family and you're helping that family work with different agencies to really make sure that they're having a um, level of cultural understanding about that family. And then we often talk about in supervision to help the parent support provider realize that they're in a supporting role to the family. They're not in a directing role. So supervision really needs to stress that we're not here to work with families, just to tell families what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. But we're in a support role because what we want to do is we don't want to give families a fish. You know the old saying, uh, give a person a fish and they eat for a day. But if you teach them how to fish, they can eat for a, li a lifetime. And so that's what we want to do in our supervision. We want to make sure that the folks we're supervising are supporting, and uh, encouraging and empowering families and not just giving them direction. So let's look at individual and system level supervision because this is something that I think that people, uh, from our experience, when we've talked back to some of the folks in the field, 
they have not paid much attention to the system level. So we think that parent support providers right now do a really great job on the individual level. They do a good job of advocating for that family, advocating for that child, making sure that they get the services and supports they need, making sure they know what those individual and personal goals are for that child, making sure that they know what the goals are of that family, and helping them to reach their goals. And that's great, and that's what we really want our parent support providers to do. But also, we want to make sure that our parent support providers and peer support providers can uh, do some of their work on a system level. So help us uh, supporting navigation through multiple systems and advocating for change within those systems if that's appropriate. One example that I can give you is uh, one of the parent support providers is working with a family and the son in that family really wanted to play football for the high school team. But this particular school had a rule that if the child was being served in some of the special education programs, they could not play on the formal team of the school. And they could do uh, recreational and after school sports, but they could not be a member of the team. So that parent support provider did a lot of their work with that school principal to make sure that they allowed children who had special needs but really had some skills to be able to play sports for the school to be able to do that. So that's an example where that advocacy uh, went from an individual level to a system level. And the support to that family went from an individual to a systems level. And so the school did change their policy. And as long as those kids could um, function appropriately on those teams, they were allowed to play on the teams. So that was really taking the job of that parent support provider to a systems level. And I think it's important that uh, during supervision that we also talk to uh, parent support providers about doing that systems level work. So let's talk about types of supervision, because there's many, many multiple ways to do supervision. And we get a lot of questions about this. And so I hope that I, we can share some light on this. And maybe some of you guys in the chat box can let us know just kind of what kind of supervision that you've done and what supervision you think is best. So we've kind of done this little chart from what we've heard thus far from some of our folks who are already out here in the field doing uh, peer support work. So the first type of supervision is 101 supervision, and we think that's pretty good that folks do 101 supervision. And then there's group supervision and peer supervision. That may be a little bit better uh, in some ways than uh, 101. And then there's team supervision, and we put a smiley face behind best on team supervision. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to walk you through each one of these types of supervision. And then you can kind of see for yourself what works best for you and what type of supervision you think is best for um, your agency or your um, community. So one-on-one -on -one supervision is kind of the supervision that most people do. This is typically when you have one supervisor who supervises uh, one parent support provider. They handle personnel issues with that person. Uh, they do that person's performance evaluation. Um, they have time that they share their victories. They can talk about what went well when they're working with their families. They also talk about their challenges. And they work with their supervisors to uh, strategize around those challenges, uh, to get feedback. One-on-one um, -on -one supervision is very task-oriented. Um, uh, you can do uh, non-task discussions around, you know, what you would think would work better as a, uh, a theory to help this family, a practice to help this family. And uh, sometimes this supervision ends with a game plan. It ends with you coming in with some strategies or challenges and your supervisor really helping you out. And you walk away, you know, feeling like you really got some support to go on and do uh, a better job. So that's one-on-one uh, -on -one supervision. So let's talk a little bit about group supervision. And group supervision typically is a group of parent support providers. Maybe there are three or four parent support providers that's hired in one agency. And that group of uh, peer support providers has uh, one supervisor. Now that supervisor meets with them as a group. Uh, and uh, the supervisor leads the group supervision. Now, they may not get into personnel issues, one-on-one -on -one personnel issues. The supervisor will probably pull the person 
aside separately if they have a personnel issue. But what they normally do is they talk about what's going on with their families, uh, they give feedback to each other, uh, they get feedback from their supervision, uh, they can get constructive criticism from their supervisor, and in group supervision they can also get constructive criticism and suggestions from the other peers, the other parent support providers who are part of this uh, group supervision. And so that works well for a lot of organizations uh, who have hired multiple parent support providers and uh, they share similar caseloads. And then there's peer supervision. And what we mean by peer supervision is everyone uh, on the team are all parent support providers. They all do peer support work. And so they um, meet sometimes one-on-one -on -one, or they meet as a group. And there's usually one person, a senior person, who may have uh, several years of experience doing this, who kind of is seen as more as the peer lead. Uh, they may be the uh, executive director of the family-run organization or the person who has the title of uh, senior peer support provider. And so that kind of happens on a um, peer level. So uh, this, uh, they take turns of sharing different things. Um, they discuss practices that have helped, uh, things that may not have been so helpful. They do sometimes case studies. They talk about what's going on with their families. They give each other feedback. They give each other uh, constructive criticism. And it's really a time of growth because we do know that sometimes that peer-to-peer -peer support uh, really helps us learn from each other. And so the last model uh, that I can talk to you about is what we call team supervision. And we haven't seen this uh, happen a lot yet around peer uh, support providers, but uh, we have heard a lot of people talk about this model. They said it's, it's somewhat of a challenging model, but it's very rewarding. So in team supervision, you have both your clinical and your non-clinical people who are part of the supervision team. So you have uh, seasoned peer support providers, you have new peer support providers, and you have all of your clinical people uh, creating this team. And then all of the team members take turns facilitating. So some of your meetings can be about a case study with the actual family, and it can be led by the peer support provider who's uh, working directly with that family. And some of the supervision can be around clinical issues. And so you practice and you talk about administrative issues because even the people who do your administrative supervision is a part of your team. And supervision in this team model is more on a consensus basis. So you can bring issues to the team, challenges to the team, uh, you can set policies and procedures with the team, and then you can reach consensus. Uh, the other thing about this is it seems to be more holistic. So like I said, uh, you get the clinical uh, view, you get the administrative view, and you get the first-hand, on-the-field, one-on-one view from working with the family. So um, this teaming uh, really seems like it works for uh, a lot of people, and it can really have good outcomes for the family to serve, but it may be a little bit more difficult because of the, the level of reporting and recording that you have to do in order to be uh, Medicaid billing. But when it works, uh, it works really well, and it's a good um, it's a good practice to look into. If, if any of you have ever tried uh, team supervision, uh, we certainly like to hear about it. I'm going to take a couple minutes to address a couple of questions, if that's okay. Wonderful, um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, just for everyone's information, this webinar is being recorded and the recording as well as the PowerPoint slides will be available. Um, the TA network will send out the recording and a copy of the slides um, in their TA telegram. If you do not receive their TA telegram, um, we will post that information on our Facebook and Twitter pages. So um, just be on the lookout for that and give us close to a week so we'll get that information out. And this particular webinar is just discussing the training and supervision piece. I know a lot of you guys have been interested in the definition and the core competencies 
And so if you would like for me to send you that information, because the definition is not included in our slides, I'll definitely um, send you that information. If you could send me an email at jspencer at f as in Frank, f as in Frank, c as in child, m as in Mary, h as in health, dot org. Send me an email and I will reply with um, our definition of a parent support provider on the national level. Um, and I could also send you some information about um, the core competency areas that we measure. Thank and I you, also Sophie. wanted to um, thank Christy for her feedback. Um, she says that her program does, uh, I think, peer-to-peer -peer and group supervision, and that works out well for them. So that, that's great feedback. So we appreciate that. Oh, wonderful. So thank you guys for uh, being really interactive in the chat box. And if any of you uh, do any other kind of supervision that you'd like to share with the group, uh, please do so. And Joy will uh, chime in again and let us know. I would really like to know if anybody is doing teen supervision because we have, like I said, we don't have a lot of examples of that particular model, but we are very interested in it. But we know that a lot of people do group supervision and one-on-one -on -one supervision. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to move along to talk about Medicaid and, and uh, certification. And I know I've mentioned this before, but Medicaid requires that a certification process be in place in order for them to be able to uh, reimburse for parent support services. So many states uh, have a certification project uh, process already for their adult peer uh, support role, but uh, they often don't have anything already in place that includes parents uh, as peer support providers. So in a lot of states, you have to do an amendment to your Medicaid plan or figure out a way um, that parents and caregivers can be added so that parent support provider can become a Medicaid billable service, but they will still have to have some form of certification in order to do that. So you must know your individual state requirements because each state has their own Medicaid plan. And what I hear people say, if you've seen one state Medicaid plan, you've only seen one state Medicaid plan because they usually are not alike and they're not duplicated from state to state. So it's up to you to really check your state's website and see what your state's requirements are around your Medicaid plans and see if they already have a mechanism in place to be a parent support um, as a billable service. And if not, that is something that uh, you can work with us at the Federation. Uh, we have uh, technical assistance around helping you to work with your state Medicaid office to make that happen. So um, remember, you must meet your state's training and certification requirements to be on Medicaid. And we know that a lot of people are getting national certification, and uh, we recommend that you get national certification, but you need to make sure that once you're certified nationally, that your state will accept the national certification to meet your state requirements. So we will always want to make sure that we let people know that as we go along. So Allison has a pretty good example of that. She says for um, in her area, their peers work within a clinical setting because that is the only model that will bill for Medicaid. So they use a co-supervision model where the peer supervisor is also present um, so that they can meet the requirement to bill for Medicaid, but also keep their um, family values intact with their peer support model. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and I think that's a really good model, especially when uh, the parents are hired outside of what we call a typical family run organization. So thanks, Allison. That's really helpful. And I think that uh, some other people may be doing that. So um, thank you for providing that information. So I wanted to talk a little bit about more. the difference. Oh, go ahead. You can hear. Go ahead. I'm Before sorry. There's a question. Um, that you may be able to answer. Um, do you know if any states have CMS approval for their peer supervision? Uh, so Medicaid, Medicaid, yeah, there, there is about 30, 35 states. Um, and uh, we have a, a slide with that information. So again, send Joy your email and I will send it. So there are several states who have already um, 
can already bill Medicaid for peer support. Oh, you're asking about supervision. Now that I don't know, so uh, I will keep that. I don't know if there's any state right now who uh, are paying supervisors for parent support. I know they may be doing it in the adult world. So Heather, if you're specifically talking about uh, CMS for parent peer support, I don't quite know the answer to that, but I will, I will definitely look into that. That's a good question. Okay, so let's look at, real quickly, the difference in the certificate program and the certification program, because a lot of our states have hit a snag with this, especially if they're trying to get Medicaid billable. So Medicaid plans require certification. Now, a lot of families and family organizations and other agencies have given families certificates and then realize later that uh, Medicaid will not uh, accept a certificate program. So what's the difference? So in a certificate program, the eligibility is that folks typically just attend a training or an event uh, just to say that they attended and they got that experience. But in a certification, this includes uh, education, uh, there's a, a experience you have to have as a requirement, and there's also usually some work experience that you already have to have before you can get certified. In a certificate, you just can attend without having to be mandated to have that experience already. So what about program? For a certificate, uh, you just have to um, show that you have the skills and you take a specific training and it's focused upon a set of learning objectives. So you go to a workshop or training, they have learning objectives and you just have to say that you went to that training. For certification, there's particular skills knowledge and competencies that you have to uh, re uh, require in order to get a certification. So it really has to be a professional role, a professional set of skills and competencies. So as far as program, when you get a certificate, you just have to say that you have knowledge in that particular area, that you went to the training, you have some interest, and you gain some knowledge from that training. Certification, you really, really do have to show that there were skills and competencies again. But in the certification process, you would have used a group of subject matter experts. And that group of certified uh, subject matter experts are the group that really came up with these competencies around this profession so that we know that they are really valid competencies and they're the skills that you need in order to really be certified. So that's taking it a whole different level than a certificate. And then the award for a certificate is usually get a certificate saying that you completed a certain amount of trainings or courses. But in a certification, you have to show that you mastered the competencies. And that has to be able to be measured. So it's usually measured by some type of uh, exam or test or application. There's something that you have to do to prove that you not only had the training and you took the courses, but that you mastered them and that you can pass the exam. And then with uh, a certification program, there's usually uh, some type of recertification. So with a certificate, sometimes it's a one-time deal. You take the course, you get a certificate, and you're done. And it's usually not time limited, so you don't have to go back and renew that certificate. But in a certification, uh, it's time limited. Uh, you have to renew that certification at the end of two or three years, most likely. And in the interim of your uh, certification, there's usually a criteria for a continuous education or uh, to get continuous training so that when you come back up for recertification, you have to prove that you really did have the, uh, the training that you need to recertify. So it's a big difference. And sad to say that some folks have uh, confused that and they thought that the certificate they had uh, qualified them to be certified parent support providers, and it did not. So we'll say again that if you are in your organization trying to do Medicaid uh, billable services for parent support providers, you must have certification. And so you must be sure that your training uh, and your certification meets uh, approval by your state Medicaid office. 
So your training and your certification uh, must meet the requirements in your state. So we just want to really reiterate that uh, even though you have national certification, you still have to make sure that it, um, that it really does meet your uh, requirements in your state. So we have about uh, 15 minutes or so, and I wanted to see if there were any more questions uh, from the audience in the chat box, if you had any other examples around how you do training or supervision within your organization, um, and uh, anything else you wanted to share before um, I turn the corner to wrapping us up. Um, I will highlight a comment of um, people are asking about youth peer support. And so youth peer support is um, it's very important, and I just wanted to, to make sure people know we are um, specializing in parent peer support, although there are many, many youth peer support programs, and the definitions vary slightly. So if it's youth peer support that you're most interested in, um, again, you can send me an email, and I think the best person to speak with about those specific core competencies and definitions would be Youth Move National because they're doing a lot of work in getting um, youth peer support on a national um, on a national base, nationally certified. And I know a lot of their chapters currently have a lot of youth partners and youth peer support partners and a lot of youth support programs. So although um, they're very similar, youth peer support is slightly different in the, in the way that they focus on their code competencies because they're going to be um, different things that we want to address with youth um, versus parents. Well, so those are really you. good questions, and they're very similar, but there are some differences. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys get the information that will help you the most. Right, and I do see in the chat box where some of you say that you all are, uh, you have training or you're creating training, and we think that's wonderful. I think one of the things that we are trying to do here at the National Federation is to find out what training already exists so we can have a um, create some type of uh, repository for you guys to be able to uh, help us log some of the training. So if you're willing to share that uh, with other states and communities, uh, also send us an email because we really would like to make some of that available. Right now, the National Federation doesn't have formalized training for parent peer support partners, but we are in the process of developing a training curriculum. Our training curriculum would be specifically uh, geared toward our national certification, and it will address those uh, core competencies that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. So we're in the process. It'll be a few months before we are able to roll some of that out, but we will be uh, doing a few webinars later on in the year, in the beginning of next year, uh, on each of those core competencies. Um, so that uh, families can be trained around those. And the other thing I'd like to mention is that we are also working with states uh, to do what we call reciprocity. And so we want to make sure that uh, if a family member gets a uh, national certification, that it does meet the standards of state certification uh, in your state Medicaid office. So we've been working with a lot of you. So if any of you guys, um, want that type of uh, assistance from us, you can do that. Uh, we also have a summer meeting that's coming up that we're going to be having uh, in July 30th and 31st in Durham, North Carolina. And this is a two-day meeting where we're going to be working with uh, states and delegations, where we're going to be asking people who have funded uh, system of care grants to uh, fill out an application to come to the summer meeting. We're going to be working around parent support providers, getting them certified, making sure that they are Medicaid uh, billable services, helping you uh, figure out how to amend your Medicaid state plans uh, to really make this a viable and a billable service. So uh, if you don't already get, like Joy uh, mentioned, the TA Telegram, uh, send us an email because we can send you the link so that you can register for that summer meeting. Uh, again, the summer meeting is July 30th and 31st, and it's in Durham, North Carolina, and it's all going to be around the uh, parent peer support provider. And right along with that uh, same meeting, uh, Youth Move National is going to be doing one in the same place with us, but we're going to break out, and they're going to do the section on peer uh, youth peer support. 
So uh, you can sign up for that meeting and you can decide which track you want to go to, whether it be the family peer support or the youth peer support. Okay, and I see a question. It says, will the definition of family uh, peer support be provided as well? Absolutely. Um, I will add those definitions to my um, PowerPoint so that after this webinar is over and they send out the um, PowerPoint and the archives, I will make sure that the definitions are a part of it. And uh, somebody also asked for the list of core competencies. I will make sure that that's added as well. So we will make sure that you all get that information uh, and we will make sure that you have our email addresses also that you can uh, ask us for it. I'm going to pause for a minute to see if there are any questions. Um, so there's a question about um, besides the curriculum we're developing, are there any other training curri curriculums for parent peer partners? Um, so the answer to that is yes. Most states that have um, certification for parent support partners do have a training curriculum. Um, I think New York, for example, definitely has one, but they're state specific. Um, so we have our director of parent support uh, provider initiative has contact with those people. I'm not sure if she has those trainings on hand, um, but if you would, you know, check back with me in a couple of days, I will find out. Um, so, like I said, they're, they're mostly state specific. The link that I'm posting right now. Um, and some of the trainings that are, are more general, they may not cover all of the domains, but there are some trainings on some specific um, competencies. So I posted the link to that, and the, that list can be found on our website. Um, so, so hopefully that information helps. It's, it's not much, and it's not a full training, but um, there is some helpful information there. Right, and if you look on the screen now, Linda Gargan is the uh, person who was supposed to be presenting most of this webinar today, and I told you she had some difficulties with the flight that was canceled. But she right now is directing the parent support uh, provider initiative here at the Federation, but she also works a lot with many different states, and so she could be able to uh, answer some of your questions around who already has training that they've developed uh, and uh, where you can connect with those people. So on the screen, I have Linda's direct phone number, and I have her email address. And also, if you visit our website, we have a section of our website uh, devoted to uh, parent support provider certification. Uh, and you can get uh, in the definition, the core competencies, uh, information about how to become nationally certified. All of that can be found on our website as well. So this contact information is up on the screen now. So, Joy, did you see any other questions that we needed to address? Yes. Yeah, so, um, there's a question. Um, do you know if anyone is tracking the impact to service utilization? Where certified PSPs are built? Where certified PSPs being built through Medicaid is, is implemented? So, is there any data that um, tracks the impact of the services? I do know that uh, we don't have a lot of data yet, but I do know there are some communities who have started the process. Um, I know that uh, in Michigan right now, they're starting to create an instrument so that they can uh, record some, some outcome data. Uh, I know that right now, uh, Fred Love, the, the Executive Director Leadership uh, Organization, they're starting a project where they're trying to collect data around the impact of parent support providers. So I, I would say that that's probably the single most uh, challenging uh, part of this right now because this is a new kind of a new workforce initiative, and so we don't yet have uh, the data to prove its effectiveness. But uh, like I said, we've only been certifying people less than two years now, so uh, I think that's something that we need to do. Um, some of the system of care communities are trying to include some of this data as a part of their national evaluation work. Uh, and so I'm hoping that within the next year or so, uh, we'll be getting some more data out about that. So there seems to be more data available on the state level. For example, Allison in Oregon said that they have four years of data from their peer-delivered services. Um, 
FREDLA is a good resource, and they know of states that have data. I think they did a webinar last week um, where there were a couple of states who presented data. Um, I remember Alaska being one of them. Um, and so, yeah, individual programs seem to, seem to have data, individual programs that have been around for a long time, and we're currently working on collecting data at the national level. I'll try to get the um, website for you guys so that you could ask them if they have any more information about state programs. Yeah, and I see in the chat box where uh, New York State has developed an outcome tool for family peer support. Uh, so that's good information to know. So yeah, there there is some uh, available. And so I hope that you guys are taking advantage of what you're seeing in the chat box uh, so that you can be communicating with other states. Um, we're really excited about the fact that data is being collected because um, we really need to be able to have the, the, the right data and information to make this a uh, viable workforce because we know that it's needed. And we have so much uh, anecdotal uh, information around the effectiveness of uh, parent peer support, but we really know that in order to sustain this effort, we're going to need the data. So I appreciate uh, the feedback that we're getting uh, from you guys on the chat box. And so I'm going to wait a minute or two. I see a couple of more people. Um, typing. But in the meantime, I wanted to give you guys a heads up and tell you to mark your calendars for the uh, National Federation of Families 26th Annual Conference. It will be held in Washington, D.C. again this year at the Omni Shoreham Hotel, November 19th through the 22nd. And uh, the call for proposals is now out uh, and it's open until mid-April. So uh, all of you who are doing such good work with uh, parent peer support partners, those of you who collected some of this data, we love to uh, have you present. We love to hear about it. Um, and so we uh, ask you to avail yourself and, and attend the conference and send us a proposal. We love to uh, have you present. Any more questions in the chat box, Joy? The last question I see. Um does a hiring organization have to be a part of system of care? Um, so can a home health agency that would like to implement um, peer support do so? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Peer support providers are being hired now all over the country in multiple agencies. So this is not a system of care initiative. Uh, this is more of an initiative uh, to support families and young people across the country. Because what we realize in all of our 26 years of experience at the Federation is that there is not, and we don't know if there ever will be, enough clinicians to meet the support needs of families and young people who are needing uh, mental health services and support. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, any agency can hire them. We always recommend that they um, connect and get supervision and support from a family-run organization so that those family support providers can have, you know, additional support other than the agency. But absolutely, uh, any agency can um, hire parent support providers, and we hope that they do. And Allison made a good point. Um, her organization is not a system of care site, um, but they do use a lot of the values and models um, that system of care sites use. Um, and those really just highlight the importance of um, empowering family members, educating family members, engaging family members. Um, so, so those models are, are really good to use, but no, you absolutely do not have to be a system of care site. Wonderful. And I would, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but we do have a Parent Support Provider Institute as a part of our annual conference as well as a policy day as a part of our annual conference. So policy day um, could be used to really give you some tools to advocate to your state um, policymakers and stakeholders about why peer support is so valuable and why it should be a Medicaid billable service. And then the Parent Support Provider Institute will be able to give you some tools about replicating some of the program models seen in other states and areas. So those. Um, 
will be really good resources and a really good thing for you guys to attend, especially those of you who are implementing these types of services in your own area. Great point, um, Joy. Thank you so much. So it seems like the chat box is a little still now. I want to just take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining the webinar today. Uh, like we said, the uh, webinar will be archived uh, and be sent out to everyone. I will make sure that you all get the definitions and the other materials that you asked for that was a part of the presentation. And I hope uh, to see you in November in Washington, D.C. at the National Federation of Families Conference. So Joy has added her um, email address. Again, this is Linda Gargan, who is the director of the uh, Parent Support Provider Program here at the National Federation. I have her email address on the um, screen, and it's also in your chat box. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope that you all have a good afternoon.